So we're good to go? <laughs> we are good to go. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Drew. Hey, uh, it is great to see everyone in person. Uh, it really is. It's uh, really nice to see everyone. And uh, we'll call to order the State Route 37 Policy Committee of Thursday, March 2nd, 2023 to order. And with that, we'll ask Drew to uh, do a roll call vote and confirm our quorum. Yeah, certainly. Good morning, State Route 37 Policy Committee. We'll start with the County of Marin with Supervisor Eric Lucan. Here. Uh, Supervisor uh, Stephanie Moulton Peters. Here. The County of Napa. Um, Supervisor Belia Ramos. Here. Um, and I was informed from um, Mayor Leon Garcia and uh, Supervisor Alfredo Pedroza and Mayor Robert McConnell that there is a conflict with the Napa Valley. Napa Vallejo Waste Board meeting, and they may or may not be arriving later today. Um, County of Solano, Supervisor Aaron Hannigan. Here. County of Sonoma, Councilmember Victoria Fleming. Here. Supervisor Susan Gorin. So which I believe she might be right here. County of Sonoma. And then uh, Chair uh, David Rabbit. Here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> And with that, we do have a quorum. Great, thank you very much. With Napa not here today, I hope people are thinking about what, how we should, oh, there you go. <laughs> well, you know, we're still, uh, you're under ban, so we, we might, uh, uh, if, if any, uh, anyone wants to make a motion on that, go, we'll go forward. I will uh, want to open it up for public uh, comment. Uh, if you have anything to speak to this body about, now's your opportunity. Seeing no one rise here. I see one member of the public on Zoom with their hand up with uh, Clayton Smith. Clayton, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. At your recent meetings, you, uh, not your meetings, but the recent meetings of the Transportation Authority of Marin, uh, it was noted the difficulty in finding uh, replacement bus drivers uh, for uh, your uh, bus routes, and that being one of the reasons for um, terminating some of these routes or limiting their usage. And this brought to my attention um, the work uh, of a Wall Street analyst and hedge fund manager, Edward Dowd, uh, in his book, Cause Unknown, the epidemic of sudden deaths in 2021 and 2022. Um, and this is a study of his uh, work in the analysis of the group life insurance and disability business, and particularly his focus on their payouts and their corollary uh, uh, with the Department of Labor and Medicare and that avail available from VAERS, the Vaccines Adverse Events Reporting System. It is clear from his inquiry that the experimental inoculations rolled out in 2021 and 2022 have greatly, gravely affected the uh, population of working age adults, not only from the excess deaths involved, but much more significantly from the excess disabilities, which are a multiple of the excess deaths, uh, the permanent excess uh, increase in long-term disabilities in the United States is now 1.8 million individuals who uh, have left uh, the uh, workforce because of these, uh, the jabs. This is going to greatly impact all labor intensive activities going forward, leading to widespread shortages in the years ahead, which has some takeaways. One, the labor costs that are in your estimates of your projects likely need some very great upward revisions. The second is that uh, the novel introduction. Mr. Smith, if you, uh, if you can wrap it up, please. Yes. Uh, the novel introduction of the technology of lipid nanoparticles in vaccinations going forward, you need to uh, 
not mandate to your workforce. Otherwise, you're going to have a difficult retaining them. You're All right. not only Appreciate that. You, this is the Resilient 37 meeting. Uh, appreciate that. Is there anyone else in the public, Drew? Uh, yeah. So next I have in line is Paul Thies. Paul, I permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Um, hi, my name is Paul Tice. No worry about the last name. I'm used to it. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to comment. Uh, I live in Vallejo and I represent the Solano group of the Sierra Club. I ask that for the sake of environmental justice, you include a substantial low income toll discount as a cornerstone of your financing plan for this project. Why environmental justice? Many lower income residents of Solano County use Highway 37 to reach jobs in Marin and Sonoma. They are prevented from living closer to work by exclusionary housing policies. The Sierra Club wants to bring jobs and housing closer together to minimize pollution, prevent urban sprawl, and protect our precious farmland and open spaces. We support affordable housing within existing city limits, but building adequate worker housing in Marin and Sonoma will take decades. We must act now to ensure equitable worker access. As you know, a toll discount bill is no longer before the state legislature. Senator Dodd's bill last year included a 20 to 50% low income discount. I believe 20% is inadequate to overcome present and past patterns of racial and economic discrimination. Let's start at the high end with a 50% discount for low income workers on Highway 37. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Chair Rabbit, I don't see any of the members of the public with their hands up. Great, thank you very much. And I'll bring it back. I do wanna uh, recognize the executive director of MTC, Andrew Premier, uh, who when he was last with us was the deputy director of MTC. So congratulations and thank you uh, for all your work. Um, we'll move on then to consent calendar today. There's uh, 3.1, 3.2, the minutes of our previous meeting. And uh, four announcements are listed under 3.2. I'll look to my colleagues if there's any questions, comments, or concerns on the consent calendar. Uh, Chair, when the time is right, I will move the item for the consent calendar and the minutes. I would ask that the policy committee chair, vice chair, elections conversation um, move down the agenda as we're waiting for our three other members to join us. Hearing no objection, that's fine. Any uh, any comment? Again, I appreciate the uh, motion on the consent. I'll get a, if I can get a second, then we'll go to public comment on the consent. I'll second the motion. Great, thank you very much. And I'll look to anyone here in the room if anyone has any comments on the consent calendar today. Um, through, through Please, the chair, um, I was not here for item three point one, so I'll okay. be seeing that item. And that for me as well, David. Okay, thank you. Drew, I'm looking at you to see if we have a quorum uh, on, on the minutes or we need to continue that or hold off on that consent we'll entirely. Okay. Well, if we're going to hold off on the policy committee, uh, item number four, perhaps we'll hold off on the consent calendar total and just bring that back uh, if that's okay with uh, my colleagues. We do have a hard stop today at, at I think, 11 o'clock because this room is going to be uh, occupied by another meeting. So with that in mind, we'll have some brevity and we'll move forward um, to item number five, which is a uh, discussion and information items. First up is operations and maintenance update. And we have Bart and I uh, from Caltrans. Bart. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm gonna be giving an update on the, um, on the, the flood mitigation that took place over Martin Luther King weekend. Um, sort of from the perspective of, uh, of public information, since that's the group that we've, uh, that we've established with all of our agencies um, working uh, communally. 
So on, on Saturday, January 14th, both eastbound and westbound lanes on State Route 37 were closed because of high flood waters. And this was caused, of course, by heavy raining uh, in a short period of time and some tidal action. So, and it primarily occurred at Novato Creek that overtopped at a private levee. Our maintenance teams had been, uh, had been looking at the area and be, been ready to respond. And we were able to get both eastbound lanes and one westbound lane open by 11 a.m. on Monday, January 16th. So that's a little over two days that we were without service out there. And then we were able to open the number two westbound lane Wednesday morning on January 18th. So we had full capacity back within about four days. Now that, um, that could have been worse. We've seen worse things in 2017 and, and 2019. And since that time, um, Caltrans maintenance has been working on things like Im improving the drainage inlets, uh, clearing and grubbing constantly or along the route. And also um, there have been many pavement um, and, uh, and, and water runoff improvements that have been made on the route since then. So that helps our response time. And you're also gonna see this year, a lot of work continuing to maintain the route. Now, obviously we're sort of looking at, we're in the middle, kind of like a, a sunny part uh, between storms that are happening right now. So our maintenance team is, is watching State Route 37 uh, very closely. Uh, in order to uh, remove the, the floodwaters, um, we had staged pumps and bladders and all the materials the maintenance teams needed to, to get the water back off the roadway. Um, we had six total pumps that were used in the operation to, to clear the, the roadway out. And the, the pumps had to be located in westbound lane number two. So one of the things we saw in communicating this with the, with the press is at one point, it looked like the route was ready to, the final lane was ready to be open, um, but we weren't able to open it yet because we were still taking water out of where it was over top. So once that was done, we were able to open the route back up. As far as public com communication during this time, um, the entire region was, uh, was reeling from some of the storm weather. So Caltrans District 4 had our um, emergency operations center in effect. And so we were, we were meeting in that operations center twice daily, monitoring all the situations throughout the Bay Area and state throughout 37. And um, we kept our partners updated on our strategies through our regular meeting um, that happens weekly on, on Wednesdays. Uh, we were doing daily State Route 37 traffic advisories, so people knew exactly where we were regardless of what time it was and whether the route was open or not. We were having special storm-related updates given as, as news progressed. And uh, through social media, we were using our, our staples, Twitter and Facebook, to, to put information out there so people knew what was available. And of course, we were pro promoting um, Caltrans Quick Map and 511 so that people could plan their routes. And so these are the strategies that we're continuing, continuing to use as we're going through the, the storm processes now. Um, but that's basically the update and what took place over Martin Luther King Week. Great, thank you very much, Barb. Appreciate that. Looks to my colleagues, any questions, comments, or concerns on that? Thank you, thank you for all the work, appreciate it. All right, thanks. Thank you. thank you for the update. Uh, next up, uh, Kevin uh, Chen with uh, the Sears Point to Mare Island Improvement Project. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Kevin Chen with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. Uh, I'm with the Design and Project Delivery Section. So I'm here to give you an update on the uh, Sears Point to May Island Improvement Project. Um, first of all, I just wanna share good news that we've completed the environmental document. Um, so the document was approved on February 9th and it, a notice of determination was filed with the uh, State Clearinghouse uh, on uh, February 13th. So I just wanna say a big thank you to all our partners, especially uh, Caltrans, Dina and her team and the, all the deputies. There's a lot of hard work that went into it in the last couple of months to wrap up that uh, environmental process. So it, it's a, a, a very big milestone uh, for us to achieve. Um, and uh, as you can see here, moving forward, you know, this is kind of like you know, just the beginning of it. Once we're done with environmental, the real work starts with the final design phase of the work. So um, we, moving forward, the plan is that MTC and Caltrans will form an integrated team, meaning that the actual design work is gonna be done partially by MTC staff internally, 
as well as being supplemented by uh, a consultant team to be um, uh, to be hired by NTC. Um, so funding has been secured for the PSNE work. Um, it, we just that we have to uh, basically finalize the funding agreement so that we can uh, move forward with the uh, design work. And part of it is that, as you might remember, that uh, SCTA did receive some uh, funds through SB 170 um, that goes into the PSNE funding. So uh, MTC is setting up you know, set up a funding plan with SCTA to get that funding transfer so that uh, we can get a fully funded uh, design phase. Now, um, part of the work is that um, uh, I, I think um, some of you might know that we have a, a partnering agreement that we've uh, um, fully executed with all the resource agencies for us to move forward on the overall State Route 37 program. And um, we would like to add very much to advance uh, some studies as well as preliminary engineering work related to the Toll Lake Creek Bridge uh, replacement, um, as well as uh, uh, to uh, make some progress on the Strip Marsh East. Uh, so that's the, um, the area south of the highway in the Solano County. Um, and I guess fortunately for us, we do have uh, a monthly meeting set up with all the resource agencies. Um, so uh, a, that's a very good forum for us to get input from the resource agencies as we um, make, make pro try to make progress on these two efforts. Uh, I think everyone is eager to get started on both the Tolly Creek Bridge work as well as the Strip Marsh East. So uh, we continue to look forward to continuing that collaboration. Um, here's a uh, summary of the funding plan for the Sears Point to May Island Improvement Project. The total cost uh, is estimated at $430 million. Um, we do have some funding secured, uh, but we, we do have a lot more work ahead of us to, uh, uh, to compete for additional funding, funding opportunities to fully complete the, complete the funding plan. So some of the th major things to highlight here is, I'm not sure if this thing works, but um, is that the um, fourth row from the top, uh, we do expect future toll revenues to contribute about 100 million into the um, uh, funding plan. Um, so that's contingent on uh, us getting the toll authority from CTC down the road. And early, late last year uh, in working with Caltrans, we did submit a couple of um, uh, uh, applications under the SB1 funding program. So we are seeking for 70 million under the SCCP program in partnership with Caltrans. And then MTC also submitted um, one for $80 million under the trade corridor program uh, under the SB1 program as well. And then I guess another thing to mention is that um, kind of second to the last row um, uh, with $73 million, we are looking to continue to apply for new grants as they, as they, as they come up. So. Uh, in the next month or so, the, uh, the federal is going to release a new round of call for projects, uh, and then we plan to go for the rural service grant uh, once again this year. Um, and we also know that there's going to be uh, some climate adaptation related grants coming down the pike from the, from the state. Uh, again, for, so for opportunities such as a Tolly Creek Bridge replacement and the Strip Marsh East, those would be uh, great opportunities to apply under this grant. Um, last but not least, uh, I think another good news is that Regional Measure 3 uh, has been cleared. So we know that there's been uh, this money set aside for the program and, and specifically for this project as well. So um, uh, and that would really be um, helpful for us to, I guess, get some certainty from ARM3 uh, to serve as matching funds as we continue to uh, compete for a number of grants. Um, so just a reminder on the project timeline. Um, as you all know, we started this project you know, late in 2019, early 2020. So it's been about three years. It's again, um, uh, uh, Chairman Robert, it, it, it's good to see everyone back in person. Uh, three years later, we, we've got through the environmental phase of the project. And here we are today, uh, trying to get started with the uh, design phase uh, as a uh, next part of work. So design is gonna take place in the next two years between 2023 and 2025. And uh, once that's complete, and once we can secure the funding, construction would happen in between 2025 and 2027. So uh, that wraps up my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. Look to my colleagues. Please, uh, uh, Director Lucas. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just a, a quick question on the timeline. You'd mentioned earlier some uh, uh, advancing and uh, preliminary work around the Tolly Creek Bridge. Uh, where does that fall into the timeline? Is that the 
Is that kind of pulled out separately or part of the whole picture? Yeah, so um, we like to proceed that that work uh, kind of concurrent with the PSNU work, basically. Um, I, I think we've mentioned this earlier, you know, this might be a good opportunity for us to um, help, help meet potential mitigation requirements for the project. And so that's part of the permitting discussion. So this design and permitting is kind of in the same phase. So, but for Tole, I think one of the things we need to do early on is the environmental clearance of the Tole Creek Bridge, uh, Tole Creek Bridge replacement itself. So we need to start the environmental work for that before we can start the design work on the bridge for sure. So, gotcha. Um, and and the 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 parameters, the the length of the bridge, and how far it's going to go—is that pretty much decided, or is that that can it could potentially be longer, it could be taller? You know, when does a bridge become a causeway? You know, heights, all that. Is that kind of all uh, to be determined? Yeah. So a lot of this is going to happen as part of the collaboration with all the resource agencies that we have a monthly meeting set up with. Um, so we just met, I think maybe a couple of weeks ago. So uh, folks are really eager to get started. So there's going to be a lot of coordination with uh, folks like uh, the water boards uh, um, and potentially potential with the Baylands group with as part of the, the greater uh, Sonoma Baylands strategies uh, on the various restoration scenario. So yeah, the exact, the exact length of the bridge um, that, that's going to be uh, determined as part of the process. Oh, great, great. I mean, the, the whole project is, is exciting, but I think that's probably one of the more exciting uh, components of the project there. Uh, and then lastly, I know it's not in this specific uh, quarter, but on the end, the, the 121 interchange, um, you know, it's, it's been a little while since this group has gotten an update on the shop project for that. So I wanted to suggest maybe as a future item to get an update of kind of what's happening in that area at a, at a future meeting. I think that's a great um, idea. Yeah, um, maybe I should uh, clarify that. So um, I guess because uh, the project limit with the interim project and the shop project are kind of really overlapping. So moving forward, we, uh, as, as you uh, can see in the final EIR, we actually are combining those projects and so that we can we can deliver those projects more efficiently. Oh, okay. So the, the, the intersection improvement as well as extending the lane drop that's all kind of wrapped into this uh, Sears Point to Mayor Island improvement project. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe we don't need a, a separate sample item for that. that That'd be great. Yeah, I'm curious to hear what's happening with uh, with that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else have, uh, Daryl? Yeah, actually, I just wanted to acknowledge the staff work of Kevin, Ashley, Andy, Dina, and their teams. They, they put a lot of work in last year. These are big milestones, and so I just want to thank them for all their extra work. So I know we've all been supporting them, but they, they put a lot of time in, so thank you. No, I appreciate that very much. I think that's echoed by the entire board. So thank you all uh, for that work. Thank you, Kevin, for all that work. I appreciate the question regarding the uh, Tolley Creek Bridge. Well, I was going to ask about the uh, making sure that the accommodation of whatever future alignment of railroad uh, will take place within that um, options will be covered and uh, the EIR will cover it as to the extent that it can legally unless we need to substantially change that or, or uh, a future environmental document regarding Railroad alignment, if it does change, is that correct? Yeah, I guess um, now I, I, I guess I'm not sure exactly where we are with the MOU uh, execution, but I know <laughs> I, I guess Smart it's pretty much part of the PLT, the ESC. Um, so we are working very closely with Smart uh, as the project develops. So. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. Anyone else have anything for Kevin? Again, thank you very much uh, for all your work, Kevin. As always, uh, we'll move on then to 5.3 flood reduction project with uh, Ricky Gal. Ricky. Chair Rabbit, are you taking public comment at the end or do you want to take public comment in each item? What, well, let's take it at the end since we're, we're pressed for time today. Can you all hear me? Okay. Hey, my name is Ricky Gao. I'm the division chief from Caltrans for uh, North Bay area. So I'm going to give an uh, update on the flood reduction in marine country from US 101 to other than MNU. Um, last policy meeting, I updated that uh, we are uh, pivot the flood reduction project to align with the PEL study result as the uh, corridor long-term um, resiliency improvement will be on the same existing alignment. So flood reduction will um, address the year 2130 sea level rise projected level um, by building the causeway from US 101 to other MEU. Um, and the same message has presented at the December 14, the second scoping meeting 
and the public uh, comments were uh, provided very positive comments from that scoping meeting. So uh, that is still taking in place. And currently, we are conducting technical studies and the project to release the environmental and circulate the environmental document in May 2023 and complete the environmental phase in October 2023. Um, obviously, um, constructing the causeway from US 11 to other MNU will cost um, a lot of money, and we are still looking for the funding sources. Um, however, as the first construction package, we will be delivering the Novato Creek Bridge replacement <coughs> as the first fundable construction package. Um, also, you may ask uh, what about SMART, uh, where, uh, as uh, we previously mentioned, uh, the project will not preclude SMART to be uh, adjacent to the uh, causeway in this corridor. So that's my update and ready to take any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Ricky. I'll look to my colleagues. Any questions on this particular item? Not seeing any. And as I said, we'll do public comment for all of these items as we move forward. So we'll move on. Thank you, Ricky, right, for that. You. We'll move on then to the 5.4 and roll into 5.5 with uh, Daryl Halls. This is talking about the Fairgrounds Drive project and also equity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is actually a two-parter. I'm going to first start by introducing Nick Burton, who's our new director of projects at STA. So he's the lead on this project. We actually have a short video that does a good job summarizing what the project is. This is the State Route 37 Fairgrounds project in Solano County that we've been working on for a number of years, partnership with the county and the city of Vallejo. Then Nick's got a couple of slides that just kind of talks about schedule, et cetera, funding. So with that, Drew, whenever you're ready. Okay, great. So before we get into it, we have got a video, gives a great overview. Uh, this this project, really the, the heart of it is a diverging diamond interchange, which is unique. Uh, and so this video really helps to show what that is and how that will look and feel. The new SR37 Fairgrounds Drive Diverging Diamond Interchange or DDI project will improve safety and multimodal access while adding capacity to support decades of future growth. Traffic studies of the Fairground Drive corridor show that construction of a DDI will reduce congestion and improve traffic flow. Pedestrian crossing times will be faster and safer and walking distances from transit will be shortened. Many drivers report that DDIs are intuitive and here's how they work. Drivers crossing the highway on Fairgrounds Drive southbound towards Six Flags will go through a traffic signal, cross to the opposite side of the road under the bridge, and then cross back over again through another traffic signal. Clear signage and striping ensure that vehicles follow the correct path. Traffic traveling northbound on Fairgrounds will do the same thing. At the first signal, they cross to the opposite side of the road, go under the highway bridge, and then cross back over again as they leave the DDI. Vehicles turning onto the freeway will have a free movement without stopping. This allows a lot more vehicles to move through the interchange than a conventional interchange configuration, and it helps reduce wait times. Vehicles exiting the freeway will be controlled by traffic signals to allow for safe merging of vehicles and safe passage of pedestrians within the crosswalks. Bicycles travel through the DDI in marked green shading bike lanes and remain to the right of vehicular traffic. Pedestrians will travel through the barrier protected center median and cross at the signals at each end of the DDI. All crosswalks are protected by traffic signals helping to improve safety. This shows where the new bus stop will be located and how the bus will travel through the intersection to get to and from the bus stop. Construction of this project is anticipated to begin as early as 2022 and will last less than a year. All existing traffic movements, including access to Six Flags, would be maintained at all times during construction. This project is brought to you by the Solano Transportation Authority, Caltrans, Solano County, and the City of Vallejo. It, it is. It's wonderful. I wanted to highlight a few additional benefits uh, that the video didn't discuss. 
Um, this innovative design is uh, really uh, a huge cost savings, about 75% cheaper than a traditional, maybe tight diamond. It reduces your right away cost, prevents you from having to spend a lot more on structure widening or just wider structures in general, right? Um, but also the, the congestion that it reduces is, is significant. Uh, the vehicle hour delay will drop from 627 uh, to 31 uh, vehicle hour delay. It, through basically through this, through both in the AM and the PM peak hour, massive reduction. Also too, that equates to about 2,400 tons of CO2 being reduced over a 20 year period. Um, the additional capacity makes way for the Solano 360 project, which we're gonna provide uh, an update at a future meeting. This project, uh, it's a development and it's gonna provide roughly 2,200 jobs, uh, 500 homes, as well as a transit center right next to this <clears throat> interchange. The transit center is significant. It includes bathrooms, electric bus charging infrastructure, first last mile connectivity, lighting and uh, security fencing. Uh, there's e-bike charging, installation of closed conduit television, uh, designed drop-off zones for buses, real-time parking info, and 19 two level, uh, level two, excuse me, EV charging stations. So these go hand in hand and, and uh, there's some significant benefits there. Safety, the DDI, <clears throat> it reduces uh, rear end accidents by 30%, but the analysis shows that there's actually a 60% reduction um, in the, uh, the cost of the accidents, showing that the severity is also being reduced by this design. Um, finally, we got bike and ped. Uh, you you saw how uh, bike and ped is really preserved and, and accommodated well through this. Um, we've got continuous class two bike lanes, uh, the protected uh, the protected barrier for the for the class one facility moving through the center. Um, but something that wasn't addressed in the video, and it's very important, all these benefits are being constructed within an FHWA designated area of persistent poverty, Cal and Viro Screens uh, disadvantaged community, and MTC's equity priority area. It's a gateway to the city of Vallejo. It also is the gateway to Six Flags, and it serves commuters going to Napa and really all the North Bay. So now let's move on to the costs. Um, we've got, we have seen an increase in costs um, over the last few years, as everybody has. Uh, our roadway construction and construction surveying and staking is around 22.6 million, landscaping around 1.4, <clears throat> and uh, CM at 3.6, taking the total project cost to 27.6 million. Um, these are in 2024 dollars. Uh, they are estimated, and we have an open bids, so it is an estimate. Um, Cost includes, uh, <clears throat> we've, we've adjusted some of these. I know some of you might, may remember a, a past update, um, but uh, wanna make sure that uh, the, the cost for construction management includes the advertise award administration, materials testing, oh, and it says construction surveying and staking, but I moved that into the roadway construction. So um, <clears throat> finally, the available funding, we've got, uh, we're seeking 15 million in RM3, um, that was identified uh, in early discussions over, over the 100 million identified for the corridor. We put uh, STIP 5 million in. Um, the county we're thinking can bring forward 2.6 million. We've got roughly a $5 million shortfall. We're seeking to uh, basically fulfill that through a variety of, of ways. We've got a raise grant application that was just submitted, as well as an earmark and, and a few other options that we're pursuing. So. Schedule, we are on track right now. Um, this could go, if we had all the money, um, could go into construction next year. We'd be bidding this towards the end of the year, meaning at the beginning, early phase of the construction season uh, in 2024, we would be in full swing. So a uh, project could go out to bid uh, in October and then awarded <clears throat> and construction begin and end in 2024. And you see open to the public in November of 2024. That purple's a little hard to see, but that's what that says. So with that, welcome any questions. I'll look to my colleagues. Yeah, I do want to make a comment. Please go ahead. Um, 
yeah, this is kind of a tourist attraction. I mean, it is it is a new it's new for our obviously new for our region. I, I haven't seen one of these um, anywhere except for in Reno. Um, one of these exists. And um, I'm looking forward to it. I think one of the other benefits, I don't know that you mentioned this, but was to relieving traffic off of Highway 80. One of the challenges with Six Flags is when they're open on the weekends or you know, the traffic backs up, uh, let's say eastbound, it could go all the way to uh, 780 interchange, uh, the backup of traffic, um, and it's pretty severe. So I really appreciate this, this innovative design and look forward to uh, turning the dart and getting it going. So thank you very much for bringing it forward. Great, thank you. Uh, if I might, please. so um, thank you for the presentation. I'm rejoining this committee <clears throat> after a few years of being off it. So can you just explain how the diamond, that whole concept of crossing over, like how that works and why that's better? Yeah, um, actually, unfortunately, I don't have a map. It's in the video, but I can I can explain. So <clears throat> the um, the benefit there, when, when you cross over and you bring traffic from your, the traditional right side over to the left side, um, what it is, is that left hand turn onto the freeway doesn't have to compete with oncoming traffic. So by, by bringing that um, transition point into the intersection, which you have to go, go through anyway, um, you, handle, you basically handle those two turning movements into one intersection. So you, you have a significant uh, savings in time right through the corridor. And so that's, that's really the heart of it, of the design and, and the benefit there. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have anything? <laughs> Seeing no other uh, questions or comments, uh, Daryl, you want to move uh, on to the equity piece? I was going to ask, Chair, we have Susan Gorin on, on, and I don't know that I saw that she had her hand raised at one point. I we requested comments from her, but true. Hi, everyone. I'm here lurking. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Aaron. Uh, I could not turn on my video, so you don't see me in person, but I am here, and Mark me is here. Thanks, everybody. Carol? Yes. So the next item is just the informational item is to start talking about equity. And I think this is something we've kind of talked about a little bit. Uh, this was, there was language in the Bill Dodd bill that, of course, he didn't get passed. That would have addressed some of the equity concerns. We had the public speaker earlier talking about green space uh, tolls. And we just wanted to kind of raise the issue again because we, we're at a point now where we're advancing the project. So that's exciting. We have arm three million to allocate. Uh, we're going to talk about tolling later this year. The, the effort is to try to get authority. MTC is working to get authority to tolling through the CTC. So we thought it was a good time to start bringing this issue up. So th th these are kind of my comments. I've talked to Aaron and Supervisor Spear, or Commissioner Spearing and, and the mayor. So they're aware of this conversation. I talk to my colleagues. I'm not, I'm not going to speak for them, but they're, they're all re recognizing these are important issues. And this, we just put together a couple of slides of some of the, the language that was in the Bill Dodd bill that we want to make sure doesn't get lost and how important it is to our, our county in particular because of the diversity of the layout there, et cetera. A lot of our residents are going down this corridor to go to jobs. So, this just a couple of slides. Um, Nick or Drew, whoever's going to show the slide show. True, I think I'm displaying, but I don't. There, there we go. So this is just some real basic stats. Um, about 38% of the trips on this corridor are coming out of Solano County. The two most prevalent locations are out of Vallejo and Fairfield, which are two of our most diverse cities. So the large percentage, about 40% of the trips are what's identified as low income resident individuals. These are folks that are going to essential jobs. They're going along this corridor. So the issue of cost of paying a toll will be a factor. So that's why issues like mean space tolls, mean space fares are important important points. Uh, as Nick said earlier on the fairgrounds project, uh, Vallejo in particular is an equity priority community in an MTC designation. It's a disadvantaged community. It's an area of persistent poverty. Right across the freeway from fairgrounds is the, the historic Crest neighborhood. And if you didn't know, Six Flags is the largest youth employer in Solano County. So that's why this access to this, to this area, both now and in the future, is really critical. Some of the issues that, of course, we, we all know this stuff, I'm preaching the choir here, but there's a number of issues we're trying to address from the, in the interim project. One is near-term traffic relief, because our residents, a lot of residents are caught every day on 37, going, trying to go west to go to jobs, then in the east in the evening coming back. We all know that's one of the reasons we formed this partnership. We don't have transit alternatives. So this gives us the opportunity for transit options. 
So we have a concept that we've been working in partnership with the trains operators and those CTAs. But again, it's gonna be really important that we provide those alternatives when the new interval project gets going. Uh, public access, we've identified in the past in Sonoma, Marin, Solano, et cetera. There are great public access opportunities along this corridor that we wanna support. There's the opportunity to put it in place means-based tolling, means-based fares for transit service. But it's important that we talk about how we do that because we need to make sure that the tolling authority gives us the ability to, to make some of these things happen. And in, in the big picture, from, from our perspective, we, we know we all know about the workers going to Marin and Sonoma County. That's one of the main reasons for the whole corridor plan. But there's also two big economic opportunities. One of them is fairgrounds, three six project, and also Mayor Island. This is going to be a huge, probably more dwarf than three six project. It's going to be probably five times bigger, which with housing and jobs, and that's coming along pretty quickly. So having access to those job areas is going to be very critical as well. In addition to making sure the quarter operates and functions well. So moving forward, what we just I just wanted to raise with this group, um, and I, we're not looking for answers today, but just to make sure it's part of our work plan, is that as we're designing the interim project, developing RM3 recommendations, seeking toll authority, it's critical we keep equity at the forefront of our conversation. And it's important that we develop some strategies for how we can make sure these Spanish communities get, get taken care of as well. So that's that's the real purpose for it, just kind of put on a radar screen. Happy to entertain any questions or discussion. I appreciate that very much. And uh, I know this has been a huge discussion at MTC um, throughout all uh, uh, the bridges throughout the Bay Area. So uh, appreciate that. And I know that as we go forward, it's great that you brought this up now because obviously it needs to be taken into account in whatever financial plan is put forward and the revenue anticipated from the tolling um, going forward as well to make sure we can pay for the, pay for the entire uh, corridor. Uh, I think we're members here. Member Hannigan? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> equity on uh, SR37 has been probably my number one um, rally cry, if you will, for improvements to the roadway. Uh, until you know, Marin and Sonoma are able to build enough um, affordable housing to support people who clean houses, are baristas, work in grocery stores, or are um, teachers, or, you know, um, beginning firefighters and, and all of that, you know, it's, it's, it's always gonna be a challenge. And the housing stock to, that supports um, a, our low income residents in our greater Bay Area is, occurs in Solano County. Um, I'll just say that. And so, you know, we wanna make it a easier pathway for those who travel for work. Um, so that one, they're not on the road. Like I was just explaining to somebody today, last night to get here was gonna take me 40 minutes. This morning was an hour and a half. And you know that's time that um, people drive every single day that is spent away from their families, away from schools. They're not able to um, take care of themselves. You know, they're, I mean, they're, they give up a lot to commute to, to their work. And so if we can lighten up that load for those folks and those families, uh, it's gonna mean a lot. Um, that, you know, there's been a, a concern about charging a toll on this road. I think most families will figure out that, you know, if they can reduce their commute time, they're more than happy to pay a little extra money to do that, um, again, at a discount. And so uh, appreciate the support from MTC and uh, other agencies for the equity, um, for the, um, the near-term plan. I think that is a... Um, it's going to relieve traffic almost immediately and uh, as we wait for the funding for the long-term uh, solution. So appreciate the efforts of this board to look at equity. Uh, it should always be at the forefront of the work that we do. And um, I look forward to uh, having more conversations about equity. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I, yeah, I just want, um, you know, means, means-based fares have been in place, you know, many years, many places means-based tolling, not, not as much. Do we have examples of other, you know, agencies across the state or across the nation that are, uh, have implemented min, means-based tolling and any learnings or, or examples that we could just look at? I'm glad you asked that. And uh, we'll, we'll go to uh, uh, Director Vermeer. And if you could also talk, Andy, about the, uh, again, the indebtedness and the service, uh, servicing of debt that we have today and how that factors into all this, because I know that's been the big Part of the discussion at MTC. Sure. Um, Andrew Vermeer, Executive Director, MTC. Th there really aren't a lot of programs for means-based tolling across the nation. We have started some 
at least uh, well, we're close to actually initiating some means-based tolling in our express lanes on 880 as sort of a test pilot. Um, but uh, to Director Rabbit's point, um, part of the problem with the bridge tolls is the first responsibility is to pay the debt and to keep the bridges open. And we have no flexibility in that space to use bridge toll funding to offer means-based discounts. If you could find another fund source that could supplement it, which we do on the Clipper Star program, it's really a, a way to find money that works to subsidize tolls or subsidize fares in that case, um, we might have some opportunities. But at this point in time, we haven't really done it before. On 37 though, we have committed to doing it. We were gonna do it in the Bill Dodd legislation. Um, and we believe that the CTC legislation gives us some authority to do so, but we're exploring that right now and intend on pursuing it but there are not a lot of good examples around the nation. Gotcha, so, so with that, a lot of, I imagine a lot of things need to be figured out and determined versus you know, tying it to the vehicle, to the individual, all of the mechanisms around you know, just how that all gets sorted out. We're kind of pioneers in this area, which is exciting, but challenging. Yeah, I think the good news there, I'm glad you brought that up. We are trying to make it as simple as possible to have folks apply in one place to be eligible for means-based discounts. So our Clipper Start program and our Express Lane program will have one place to apply. Um, they'll use the same standards um, and then that discount works in both places. So we're, we're very mindful of how hard it is sometimes to navigate that space and we're trying to be very attentive to it and, and really work on different examples that help us kind of make it easy to get in the program if you qualify. Anyone else have anything for? Please, Bill, go ahead. Uh, Chair Rabbit, may I add an informational item that's not on the agenda today? Yeah, let's take care of this one and I'll come right back to you if that's okay. Um, actually, Bill, no, I'm, I was wrong. You, you, it's time to add it right here. At, <laughs> we'll call it 5.6. 5. 5. Trying to wait for the break at the end of that no, no, item. Thanks. Good morning, uh, committee. Bill Gamlin, chief engineer with SMART. Just wanted to make everyone aware that uh, SMART in conjunction with District 4 staff will be reconstructing the grade crossing, the railroad grade crossing in, of Highway 37. Uh, this will require a full weekend closure um, Friday night from about 7 p.m. through uh, Sunday morning at about 10 a.m. Uh, we have secured a contractor for this. SMART's pretty much the lead. Uh, we're working closely with the district on outreach and detours at this time. So just wanted to make everybody aware of that. Appreciate that. Ooh, wow. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Bill on that particular item? When? <laughs> uh, we pretty much locked in on a weekend of Friday, May 19th through Sunday morning, May 21st. We'll work with our partners you, you to make sure that uh, everything is notified and All right, welcome, uh, welcome. Thank you. With, we were just finishing up the discussion information items. We did skip the uh, consent calendar and uh, item number four, so. We've been, we've been following on the list. Oh, great, yeah. appreciate that. So with uh, our discussion and information items, it is time to go to public comment. And uh, this will include all um, six items that you've now heard and uh, Mr. Bertelbaum. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Bat Rabbit and members. Uh, Steve Bertelba with the Transportation and Land Use Coalition. And I have about uh, four different items that I'd like to talk about. First of all, uh, we agree that the tolling should be for the uh, Sonoma users of the uh, ultimate project, as well as the Vallejo users. Uh, this shouldn't all rest on the people from Vallejo. Uh, Second point is that uh, sea level rise is a very uncertain issue. We don't know when the glaciers are gonna melt. Uh, we don't know how fast sea level is gonna rise. I think we should focus on the ultimate project, not on the interim projects. <coughs> and uh, uh, I hope to be talking with the transit people about 
uh, using two jumps as a way of getting transit going early. It's going to take a long time to transfer people from cars to buses. And the earlier they can see that the buses are getting there, then they're quicker than the cars, uh, the, the faster we'll make that transition. So uh, I think those issues are very important. Um, the last one is that the bus on shoulder issue is problematic. Uh, we hear that about 55% of the people using this route are in carpools. Carpools on the shoulders aren't going to work. We should extend the HOV lane all the way from Vallejo to Marin County and let the, let the uh, uh, people that are in carpools go as fast as the people are in buses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Anyone else from in this room that would like to speak? Seeing no one else rise, I'll look to Drew and if you could lead us through the uh, online public comment. Yeah, most certainly. So I currently see three members of the public with their hands up and we will start with a Thomas. Thomas, I have permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I can see this uh, project um, 37 is moving rapidly, but I, I do appreciate the uh, most recent information, which was given that the 121 is going to be combined with, I think the B section from, from Tole essentially to Vallejo because it, it really is uh, functionally important to uh, accommodate effectively that Tole lengthening and widening if that occurs uh, within that B section uh, from a standpoint of whether it's interim or, or ultimate elevation. And then it really works together. So I, I think that's important and critical to the uh, both the environmental standpoint and the and actual complete funding. It it just makes sense. Uh, the other thing is that's really fascinating, fantastic about the uh, diverging diamond at uh, fairgrounds there, and uh, we've been proposing that in Santa Rosa for a long time. There's a lot, several of them in Las Vegas, and they are very efficient, particularly with regard to the, the on-ramps and off-ramps, because it's a diamond instead of what, what you need to actually get that to occur is a full clover leaf to have the free flowing on-ramps and off-ramps and a clover leaf occupies a lot of space that you don't have to do with that diverging diamond. So it's a lot of savings on right-of-way as well as then the movements themselves are, are still efficient. So you have the efficiency of the clover leaf with the, uh, that is the movement efficiency with the clover leaf and the financial uh, efficiency with the diamond. So it's really great to see that. L really want to see that here in the North Bay, and so we can point it out for Santa Rosa, where we really need it. Thank you. Right, thank you, Thomas. Uh, next, I have in line is Ed Schulze. Ed, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Buongiorno. Exciting meeting. A um, couple of items that I have to uh, see comment on is on the 170 page document that Caltrans put out recently. And one thing is on their description of the elevated causeway from uh, Petaluma River Bridge to the Federal Fish and Wildlife near the 121 intersection, they omitted Lakeville on ramp off ramp. And I think that's a major boob there. They got to have something on there on that description. Second thing is I'm still a little confused on uh, interim project and the ultimate project. Uh, the Caltrans document spoke of breaking it up into eight different segments. Didn't say anything about the expanded fill of an interim project. And I'm a little, are we gonna go with the interim project with Phil? Are we gonna go bite the bullet and start with the 121 intersection to Mare Island? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, next we have in line is Clayton Smith. Clayton, I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Uh, this is the first time I, and I think almost anyone else in the general public, 
uh, has heard that the use of Highway 37 uh, between Sears Point and Vallejo is going to be subject to tolls. My question is, what do you anticipate these fares are going to be? Certainly, you must have at least a range in mind estimated at this point in time. Also, are these fares going to be one way, uh, such as on the bridges, or are they going to be uh, two ways? Also, how will they be collected? Are they going to be collected by camera? And how will this impact traffic flow? Uh, when, <clears throat> again, and when will the uh, public uh, be given an adequate notice of this change in usage that is anticipated? Um, finally, uh, I think that the um, idea of uh, this uh, means-based tolling uh, just uh, adds to a sense of divert of the divisiveness in our that our society is currently riddled with, and I wonder about its advisability. And finally, on this change of the interchange uh, out there at Route 37 and the fairgrounds, um, how long is this going to take, and what uh, impacts is this going to have during its construction? on the flow of traffic of people going north towards Sacramento coming um, from Marin. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next I see is Chance Kutaro, excuse me, Kutaro, the mayor of Fairfax. I have permitted you to see. Lower here for me. I've lost my, allow to talk. My, my apologies for that. I've permitted you to speak. You may start when you unmute yourself. Thank you very much and good morning members. Uh, Chance Catrano here, uh, Mayor of Town of Fairfax and Marin County. Um, but speaking on behalf of myself here, um, just wanted to thank you all for, for having this um, discussion this morning. And I um, specifically wanted to um, note um, some of the members' comments about equity. Obviously, uh, here in Marin, we have to definitely do our part and do far more uh, than we have in the past regarding workforce housing and reducing overall VMT um, on this corridor. Uh, but one of the things that came up at a recent Transportation Authority of Marin meeting um, that I wanted to bring up for folks here as well, um, it would be really helpful, I think, both for um, you know members of the public, uh, but also for electeds throughout the North Bay to really understand the, the phasing of construction uh, in the context of uh, congestion management. I, I would hate to see us moving forward with uh, an interim project for segment B um, that you know, leads to potentially decades of construction along this alignment if we're doing ultimate project for segment A interchange, trying to figure out how to mitigate bottlenecks there. Then you have segment B um, uh, for an interim project and then an ultimate project. And it could be that, you know, we, we do see uh, more congestion if that project isn't, isn't handled correctly. And I, I would hate to see that from both an environmental, but also from an equity perspective uh, and, and for the taxpayers. So um, I would highly recommend if this is the appropriate committee to have staff report at some point in the near term, uh, what that phasing could look like um, for, I, for either or option. So people have a real sense of what the impacts are on congestion um, over the coming decades as these projects roll out. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you. Um, Chair Rabbit, I don't see any other members of the public with their hands up wishing to speak. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate that, appreciate the comments. With that, we'll move back to, uh, now that we have our mayors here, uh, welcome. Uh, we'll move back up the calendar and go to uh, back to the consent calendar. And uh, as you can see, there's 3.1, 3.2, uh, the minutes from our last meeting and the announcements as listed. And uh, I'll look to my colleagues for any questions, comments, or concerns. And if not, can I get a motion to approve the consent? Thank you for that. All right, thank you for that. Um, is there anyone opposed to the consent calendar? Drew, is that gonna do it or we need to roll? Great, 
And uh, with that, the consent calendar does pass. And we'll move on then to item number four, which is the policy committee chair and vice chair elections. And I'll look, I'll open it up for nominations and uh, we'll act accordingly. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would nominate uh, Aaron Hannigan for chair. Second. Second. Great. I appreciate it. Uh, we'll look one last time and we'll close nominations on chair and look for a vice chair. I would nominate Eric for vice chair. Second. Look to my colleagues. Any other nominations? If not, we'll close nominations on vice chair and uh, look to my colleagues if there's anyone opposed to the selection of chair and vice chair. Checking Drew with, uh, I can't see the screen up there. So our, with our colleague online, we're all good. No hand raised. Yeah. <laughs> with that, we have a, a new chair and vice chair and uh, If you want to go ahead, go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> it's all yours. All right. Uh, well, we're on to future topics. And uh, there's, uh, what, five listed? And uh, look to my colleagues for any other future topics out there? Anything added to the list? Any comments, questions? RM3, I know that we just uh, completed the 30 day time period from the courts. So we'll be seeing uh, Andy will bring one of those big fancy checks the next meeting. Um, we look forward to that. Uh, through the chair. Please. Uh, I actually, it's all been finalized. RM3 is clear and ready for uh, takeoff. I was just going to say, I think the, the ESC needs to caucus a little bit. To, this is a good starting point. We, we've got polling authority. We've got on three. We've got a lot of stuff to come back to. So we'll, we'll caucus and then give you guys an update. Great. Uh, Mr. Chair, please. Yes, uh, our apologies for being late. Uh, with the Waste Management Authority meets at 9 o'clock in uh, American Canyon. Typically, when uh, the State Route 37 meets in Vallejo, we're 10 minutes away. So uh, in uh, Discretion from uh, the Waste Management Authority Board. We will look to uh, changing our hours of meeting when we have a uh, situation like this where we have to drive a long time. So, we oh, I appreciate that, and I think that we all recognize getting back together is going to probably create some other conflicts with the commute times involved and everything else. But again, nice to see everyone. Thank you for making the effort and getting over here, and, and we very much appreciate that. We just made it. <laughs> Any other uh, committee member comments and or we'll go to staff updates as well if there's anything from any of our four executive directors. Five executive directors. Sorry, Eddie. Let's get, get used to that. Not seeing any? It was going to be short, but uh, I was just, I just got an email a minute ago that the MOU that the seven entities recently adopted has now been signed and executed by all the parties. So it is in place. So thank you all for your diligence on that one. Yeah, no, thank you. And again, thank you all for all the great staff work. Um, with that, before we adjourn, just want to say thank you uh, to everyone. Uh, for all the work look forward to the next meeting and look forward to continuing on and uh, do celebrate the uh, uh, publishing of the EIR and moving in that uh, getting closer to the, the projects out there and uh, just one last comment regarding the ultimate uh, versus interim project we would I assume we would all love to do the ultimate project if someone could just hand us one of those big checks that has a five billion to ten billion dollar figure on it um, 11 there you go and that's exactly why we have to do the interim project. And I think all of us in, uh, at least I know every county knows this, here in Marin and Sonoma, the freeway that's out there getting finished up uh, 20 years and $1.2 billion. So um, if there's another path forward, let us know. Uh, we'll certainly accept the money and put it in the bank and get the project going right away. But uh, do look forward to um, the congestion relief that the 
majority of the people living in the uh, uh, East Bay need immediately, as well as making sure that we raise the uh, roadway out of the uh, bay level rise uh, coming forward. So great work, everyone. Thank you. And with that, we're adjourned.